basically, um, I will talk a bit on the problem of heterogeneity as a general problem in CLL, then present a case. I will define what fludarabine refractory is, after all. Uh, then discuss the therapeutic options and the facts to consider if you decide upon treatment in these patients. And finally, I will finish with my own treatment algorithm, so how I approach a patient or the patients with this condition. Um, the challenge of CLL is actually a beautiful one, if you want. I mean, it requires that we really look at our patient, uh, that we not, not only have the leukemia, but uh, look at the fitness, the age, but also the biology of the leukemia, the stage. And then, of course, there's a difference between first and second line treatment. And finally, that's becoming one of the, my favorite topics, the, the funny heterogeneity of therapeutic menus around the world, so that there's some confusion still, despite the fact that we have uh, trials and, uh, well, guidelines on treatment we don't have, and it's also difficult to write guidelines on treatment because everybody has his favorite thing to start with. And I will allude to that a little bit um, because that's con it's of some concern, I would say. I will start with a case, uh, a case that is actually showing you um, even when we started in 2001 with this patient to treat, but, uh, even of today, um, we can see in this patient quite nicely how the challenges are and what we have to consider. So it started in 2001, uh, this 49-year-old lady diagnosis of CLL with a generalized lymphadenopathy, which was quite striking from the very beginning and only a mild lymphocytosis. Uh, there was a fish done early on uh, outside of our hospital. It was done in a, in a practice, oncology practice in Germany, and they found a deletion 17P, thymidine kinase and beta-2 microglobulin values normal, no symptoms, and therefore, rightly so, there was no treatment. A year later, she actually was progressing had a stronger lymphadenopathy and needed treatment, at least according to the opinion of the treating hematologist. So she received six courses of fludarabine plus rituximab, a treatment that we wouldn't do or probably no longer do today, and that's why I'm actually showing you this case. Uh, and you can also see quite quickly um, what happened, because after only a very, very short time of a few months, she relapsed with progressing lymphadenopathy and had refractory disease. And then she came for the first time in 2005 in my office with recurrent infections. She was really feeling extremely sick, extreme fatigue, and had uh, large lymph nodes of uh, several centimeters, uh, in particular at the, at the um, neck. The blood counts were not all too bad. As you can see here, the white blood cells were close to normal. So what we did then is to exclude a rictus transformation in this patient. Uh, she had flat CLL and uh, had a couple of options. And I can tell you that this treatment decision with elemtuzumab um, was done while I was on vacation. Probably I was giving a talk in Canada at that time. Um, and uh, so it was Clemens Wendner, who actually decided, uh, we, we knew that we had to do an elemtuzumab regimen, uh, but I wanted to rather give a combination, and when he was responsible for her, he chose elemtuzumab single agent, which, by the way, is interesting because 50% of the patients respond, the other 50 don't, and she responded extremely well, had a complete resolution of all lymph nodes, and uh, then we went on and did a transplant. And I have to push very hard to get... Yeah, so a reduced intensity um, conditioning regimen uh, that is shown here, very, very close to what they are doing in Seattle, uh, and then a, a usual uh, immunosuppression with a rapid engraft and no problems whatsoever. Uh, in November, she still had no GVHD, but she had residual lymph nodes, so the disease did not go away, uh, and therefore uh, we decided something that you can... Um, basically um, reflect right now. She had, was still under immunosuppression and the blood counts otherwise were normal and she was feeling quite well. So basically um, what we did is uh, we stopped all the immunosuppressants, we uh, withdraw the uh, cyclosporin 
Um, and upon this withdrawal of the drug, she had a GVHD in December, and we had to restart immunosuppression with a sequence of high dose steroids, microphenolate, and later we gave her rituximab a single agent. As of May 2006, so a little later, all disease had, had resolved and she had no lymphocytes and a complete chimerism, and we could stop immunosuppression. And then with a couple of um, um, stories in between, GVHD periods in between, which were then only treated with rituximab monotherapy, uh, she now is perfectly healthy in very good uh, condition, back to work, and uh, the only very, very bad event uh, that uh, struck her a lot is the death of her husband uh, that uh, died from a heart attack. So you can see that here you undergo all the phases of a relapse treatment. You had several points where you had treatment decisions, but in a young patient like her, um, I think it's justified um, to early move into an allogeneic transplant setting, and we will discuss whether there are other options and uh, what we will eventually do in the future. But you can also see that with an early transplant, you can cure a few patients, and it's clearly visible from all data uh, that uh, allogeneic transplantation is able to overcome the dismal prognosis of a deletion 17P or P53 dysfunction. All right, so now she was clearly for refractory because she basically didn't respond uh, well anyway and then had a relapse um, a few months later. Well, the definition of refractory disease, fludarabin refractory, is a relatively vague and, uh, and uh, confusing one because you find several pro uh, definitions in, in clinical protocols, especially in clinical trials, but the, the only accepted definition is based on a few data, actually from the MD Anderson, that patients having a, a quick relapse within six months have a very, very poor prognosis. So. Uh, the guidelines did define refractory disease as a treatment failure, and treatment failure in CLL is either stable disease or uh, progression. Um, so uh, right under treatment or within six months to the last interleukemic therapy. And um, you have additional uh, definitions, which I will come to, for high-risk CLL that are not refractory, but still justify the use of allogeneic stem cell transplantation that are given by the EBMT guidelines, and they're usually a little different because there is a different population. So because there is a second category. So refractory is within six months, but we have patients at very high risk following chemoimmunotherapy, either with FC or with FCR, and this is what I'm going to show you in the next slide. So as you know, um, this CLLA protocol published in 2010 showed that FCR is superior to FC, and FCR has a superior survival, um, induces a superior survival in patients with CLL, first time that this could be shown in CLL. So now we have new data from this trial, CLA protocol, that I'm going to share with you, that uh, are unpublished for most of them. This is actually in press, basically it's now on the website, and it's showing you that the quality of response in CLL is extremely important. Um, not only the clinical response, but more so the uh, MRD assessment. So patients that have a very good um, MRD level are having a better prognosis. And I show you this in a little more detail because it's a very small figure uh, here. So if you look here, this is defined as less than 10 to the minus fourth, or one in 10,000 leukocytes. So you can see that the FC treatment is inducing uh, about 35% of these MRD negative remissions, while the number is doubled with FCR to more than 63%. So it's clearly more efficient. Then there's a group that doesn't respond at all, which is more than 10 to the minus 2, or 1 in 100 leukocytes. And here you can see they are both relatively equal. And then a group in between the two categories. But what happens when you achieve these good values here, you clean the blood and marrow um, below this threshold, you, see you have a clearly longer progression-free survival than in the other group, in the two other groups, actually. And also, as it has been shown before in smaller phase two trials, um, the better the remission is, the longer is the overall survival, and these differences are clearly profound. 
And we all know, and this is why we did these analysis, that you have some patients after FCR that have an extremely long progression-free survival and a very long survival time. So you can keep them in, under a watch and wait mode and don't have to do anything because they sometimes have eight years or more of a good life. And there are other patients that are not doing so well. And so the key question is how can we identify upfront the high-risk patients? So this is probably one thing, and I show you why we believe that. Well, what we, we seeked, we saw in our analysis that all the patients that were relapsing within two years, which is the other high-risk category, within two years, they had a poorer outcome. How could we eventually define these patients? And after lots of calculations, multivariate analyses, and all these things, we came up with the following proposal. And that is, if patients have a very high MRD load or level, it's not a high load, but it's a level above this value here, or something in between, not the good ones, the MRD minus, uh, uh, smaller than 10 to the minus four, of course, have a good prognosis. So they can be sorted out and they are actually seeing a long remission. But these here in between, combined with either the lesion 17P or P53 or IGVH, do have um, problems. And they are actually the group that is relapsing within two years. The group of um, these patients here can be defined almost to 100% by these parameters. So if you use this, you can then separate two groups that have a very distinct, a very different time to progression, as shown here, high risk and low risk. And that's the group where you can do future clinical trials, because for the good risk patients now in CLL, uh, improving on these treatments is uh, taking you for 10 or more years. You will never finish the trial. However, for the high-risk group, you, can, you have to optimize because, as I'm showing you on the next slide, the overall survival in these patients, starting from the first time of inclusion in the trial, is around 57 months, so not even five years. In other words, if a patient doesn't respond well to FCR or a similar regimen, or if he doesn't have a good response, and he's likely to come back with the disease within two years, and this means he has an overall survival of below five years, which is why we want to improve in this group of patients. While we probably can just finish, um, and FCR is doing a very good job in these low risk, high risk patients. There's one interesting thing that is maybe an important detail that I don't show you here. But this high risk group here um, is only determined by approximately 20% by the P53 status. So. Um, P53 or the lesion 17P, all the rest, the 80% of the other patients, we don't really know. And this is why we had to seek for alternative or additional parameters, and MRD is an excellent one. So what we are going to do now, it, the study has just started, is the CLLM1 protocol, where we actually, since we do not know yet which of these regimen, like FCR, uh, this is a typo, FCR, bendamustine, or plus rituximab, data from the CLL10 protocol are still awaited. So we allow all these different modalities, and then we will do a randomized comparison after uh, this here for the high-risk patients, and only the high-risk patients, in a two-to-one randomization, where we do a Revlimid or lenalidomide ma maintenance therapy in order to improve the outcome of these patients. So this is the novel strategy to uh, improve in this high-risk group. So these are not really refractory, but I think high risk enough to do something. And actually, in a younger patient that would be eligible for a transplant, I would probably select those patients for transplantation protocols as well. And we can discuss this uh, later. All right, now let's come, now we have, that we have defined the, uh, the high risk refractory and early relapsing population, and I, I told you that there are probably two groups, the really refractory patients and then the ones that don't respond for a very long time. What are the therapeutic options? And uh, here comes what um, uh, it reflects the therapeutic heterogeneity on our globe. So at the Mayo Clinic, probably, what he would be offered, a patient at relapse, is a little bit of uh, green tea. And uh, then they would look whether the patient would do with it. If you go to Seattle, I don't have to ask you what you would say now, you probably get a marrow transplant anyway. If you haven't gotten it in the first line, then you get it in second line for sure. Now, with all these 
different regimen and recipes across the globe, green tea, transplantation, and some centers antibodies, um, this is a, it's a difficult task to really select the best treatment, and I think we have to, to think about this a little more in the future to get some standardization for second-line treatments. Uh, but I will talk about these modalities except for green tea um, uh, in the next few minutes. So some, especially in Northern America, some centers actually are quite keen to give single-agent rituximab. Uh, and this is data uh, from, from our own trial. I'm just showing you these data, uh, saying again that if you give single-agent rituximab at the conventional dose, the duration of response is only measured in weeks. So it's an extremely poor agent in CLL, and it's only lymphocyte cosmetics that you can usually do with this agent. Uh, the maintenance trial that has been done by the Spanish group also is a bit disappointing. So rituximab when used in uh, relapsed settings as a single agent is, is not an efficient component. It is very, very potent in combination with drugs. There's one exception eventually to this topic, and I will, uh, we have done this in Cologne a couple of times inspired by this publication with mixed results, I should say, but um, rituximab at very high doses in combination with steroids as published by Tom Kipps and Castro a few uh, years ago in 2009, um, can eventually do something. Um, you, I, I will show you the data. What they basically did is a three-day course of a gram per meter square methylprednisolone and, rit and rituximab at the conventional doses, but uh, very, very frequently. So basically, uh, you have a much higher overall dose of rituximab in this trial. What you can see that some, this is perfectly applicable for patients that usually have a cytopenia. So very often we see the problem in CLL that patients relapse and then they are cytopenic and sometimes elderly and you don't know whether you can actually afford to give another cytotoxic regimen. And in these situations, sometimes it's worth trying things like this. And so here, uh, what um, Tom Kipps and his group could show that you could overall improve um, both the platelet counts and the hemoglobin values um, however, um, and, and the overall response rates are actually very, very good. The only disadvantage is that these responses are also not very long-lasting. So it's worth trying. When we did that in Cologne, personal experience, I should say, I'm certainly not getting to uh, the, uh, let's say, close to 100% over, overall response rate. I would estimate that is uh, probably around 50% uh, or so but it's one of the possibilities you can do. Similar principle is high dose, another high dose anti-CD20 antibody of otumumab and refractory CLL. This is basically from the trial that led to the registration. As you know, it's using also higher doses. And I think realistically, you achieve a response rate of 50%. Uh, very few or none uh, are complete remissions, except here too in the bulky lymph nodes. But you should also know, again, with anti-CD20 treatment, the time to progression is short, five months here, and the overall survival is 14 months. So while this is a solution for a short-term bridging to something, I think any of the treatments that I've mentioned, single-agent rituximab, single-agent ofotumumab, or in combination with steroids, is usually not giving you long-lasting remissions. And actually, also, it may be disappointingly, Elmtuzumab, the last antibody I'm going to speak about in this part, um, sub given subcutaneously, is giving you remissions. If you combine them with steroids, they can go up to close to 100%. However, the responses are short-lasting. Time to treatment failure here is below 12 months, and the overall survival is around 18 months. So again, in this refractory population, uh, I mean to achieve a remission, but not to really get the, um, these patients into long-lasting remissions. We recently tried to optimize on that, and it's actually a similar, very, very similar trial with similar results done in the UK by Peter Hillman and uh, the UK group. And I show you data that were updated at the last ASH meeting quite briefly. So here, just to intensify the regimen, Elimtuzumab at the standard um, dose subcutaneously combined with dexamethasone, high doses of uh, 4-day 40 milligram. And that's repeated um, 
at several times, and then it can be followed by either an elemtuzumab maintenance therapy or allogeneic stem cell transplantation. The latest data looking at overall survival and the PFS actually are similar to what's been published with uh, elemtuzumab monotherapy. You can see that here the overall survival, except for the first-line patients, the, this trial allowed some first-line patients to be included, but in second line, again, the median um, is crossed at around 12 to um, 18 months, so it's not changing fundamentally the clinical course of this disease. A small addition, a little bit of a different chapter, FCR. If you use it in, in patients that have not seen rituximab before, and this is all data published by uh, Tadeusz Robach uh, in 2010, uh, but it's just important to remind you this is uh, yielding good response rates, and therefore, uh, if a patient doesn't respond to fludarabine anymore, you can, of course, try a rituximab-containing combination in these patients. Bendamustin rituximab um, is a similar principle, although um, not cross-refractory or cross-resistant with fludarabine. This is data now published in full length or full form, um, last year at the JCO, and I highlight the most relevant findings, uh, and that is the responses in the different chromosomal categories, and I should depict one where BR, bendamast, and rituximab is not responding quite well. That's the deletion 17P. Only 1% had a response here. All the other uh, groups are responding relatively well. Trisomy 12, deletion 11, uh, 13Q, 11Q, uh, close to 100% in some groups. So it's very, very active. And for you, the most important question is, does it work in patients that, have, um, uh, that are refractory to fludarabine? And actually, the important answer is yes, it does. So about half of the patients that do, did not respond to fludarabine anymore do respond to bendamustin. So that's one of the possibilities that you can actually play around, if you wish, with these drugs if you have tried it, uh, it's actually sometimes giving you surprising responses in patients that have failed FCR. And this is some of the potential benefits of this second-line regimen. And then finally, one cannot talk about uh, refractory patients without talking about uh, stem cell transplantation. And uh, as you all know, 10, 20 years ago, or even shorter than that, uh, we were talking about... Um, a, a non-relapse mortality or treatment-related mortality of around 40% in CLL. With a novel regimen that allow a reduced intensity conditioning, uh, this has gone down to 20%, if you are honest, and count also the longer-lasting toxicities. And that's uh, seen here. So the percent of non-relapse mortality in this trial, 90 patients in a recent publication from our group here, is is around 20%, which is much better, but still not, still not optimal. You would never recommend that first line to a low-risk patient with CLL. Now, the important things in this relatively busy and, uh, slide are a few things. Again, as I told you, and as I've shown you with the case um, that we treated uh, years back, is here is all the different cytogenetic Aberrations. On the right side, you always see overall survival. On the left side, event-free survival, if you can't read it. But you can see that none of the dismal uh, chromosomal aberrations, in particular not uh, the deletion 17P, are changing this pattern. In other words, with an allogeneic transplantation, you can overcome the negative prognostic value of a P53 dysfunction or of a deletion 17P. This is the one important uh, thing from uh, this trial and from other trials as well. And then there is a debate, actually this, a meaningful debate for your clinical practice and management of CLL patients, whether or not you have to achieve a good remission before you put your patient on the transplant protocol. Now our data, and this is this here, uh, tell you that patients that have been refractory before going to the transplant have a clearer, worse outcome here. While if you look at the Seattle data and some other data, uh, they don't see this pattern. So they actually proceed, and even in patients that are not responding to the chemotherapy anymore or to any other therapy anymore, they have the same outcome. 
So this is still under strong debate in the field. What we are currently doing is to actually proceed, but because in most of our patients, we don't have a choice uh, anymore. It's more important to get them onto the transplant protocol if they fail to everything uh, than to expect that you get them into some sensitive state where they have a very, very good partial remission uh, before going to the transplant. Okay, and then in the last part, and it's, it's clearly changing our um, discussions with the patients now at least, and they will ask you about this as well. There are several new agents in CLL. And therefore, uh, it's impossible to talk about CLL refractory uh, CLI patients without discussing uh, briefly about the new agents that are coming now. And I just wish to make sure that I'm doing well with time, yeah? Because I can, I'm very, very flexible. All right, so you have the antibodies, CDK inhibitors, um, that I won't talk about, uh, lenalidomide, and then specific signaling inhibitors, uh, which are particularly important. I will not talk about GA101. We are doing a first-line trial here, but we, and we see responses, but since this drug is not available and there's not a, a large trial done in second line right now, I'm skipping this, although I think it's a very potent agent. Revlimid is one of the options. So if you have re refractory patients, one of the things that you, I'm always discussing with my patients is uh, whether we would give it a try to use Revlimid or lenalidomide. And the reason for that is shown on this table here, uh, small phase two trials. Nevertheless, um, all of them, this is a slightly different design here with a dose increase, so the numbers of responses are slower, but you see response rates between, let's say, 30 to 60%. And the interesting thing is with lenalidomide, if you do achieve a response, they are long lasting. So some of the patients, you can control them uh, for longer time. As you can see here, just as one example, uh, in elderly patients, 37% of the patients are alive at 14 months. And as, you, as I've shown you before, this is slightly different for, from what you see with enlimtuzumab or all the antibodies. So it doesn't work in all patients, but if it does, sometimes uh, it can actually be a very long-lasting effect. A new agent that um, is uh, developed in several institutions. I was just discussing uh, two weeks ago when I was at the opposite meeting to the cold meeting, at the hot meeting, with John Samer in Australia. He's actually quite keen of uh, using uh, this compound, ABT263, which is blocking BCL2. And the reason for that is that he sees patients like this, and they, we have done this in the international trial, and some of our patients are actually... Um, benefiting a lot from uh, large lymph node, bulky lymph nodes uh, that are resolving after a few cycles of this compound here. So this is clearly one interesting uh, compound under investigation, not available uh, yet. And then finally, probably the most interesting development in CLL recently, and I, I'm almost confident that every other speaker will talk about it after uh, my talk as well, is the, the attempt of therapeutically modify the B-cell receptor signaling pathway. Um, so basically, uh, what we have to realize is that the B-cell receptor signaling is critical for CLL. The antigen is um, actually binding to this B-cell receptor complex, and the stimulation is probably feeding not only normal B-cells, but also malignant B-cells. And the wonderful thing is, basically totally against my initial belief that this signaling pathway remains relevant even in patients that have P53 deletions or are, ha are having other things. So we would call this, you have eventually heard the term oncogene addiction already, which is cells remain addicted to oncogenes and that's why the inhibitors work. That's why EGF inhibition works. And so the CLL cell seems to be a cell that is remaining totally dependent on this B-cell receptor signaling pathway because if you inhibit this, you can actually get them into uh, cell death. And the elements that are in this pathway, this signaling pathway, are SAR kinases, less efficient inhibitors here. Dasatinib is, is doing beautiful things in vitro, but in vivo is not so good. BTK, the Bruton tyrosine kinase, and PI3 kinase. And we have inhibitors now in clinical trials, especially for those two uh, kinases, while the SIG inhibitor, unfortunately, is developed for rheumatoid arthritis and not for CLL. So I show you two compounds with interesting data, Cal101, now inhibiting the P PI3 kinase delta. And uh, as a mono 
therapy or single agent, it's a little less efficient than the one that I'm going to show you next. And therefore, the company has done combinations, presented at last ASH meeting, as I show you here. So rituximab plus the inhibitor, fludarabin plus inhibitor, bendamastin plus inhibitor, and finally, um, another um, rituximab BR plus inhibitor. And what you see here is that the response quality is improving uh, with the combinations. This is uh, response rates. Uh, it depends on how you rate the overall responses. There's a debate on the lymphocytosis being an issue. I think that's uh, complete nonsense because steroids are also inducing some lymphocytosis, so you can discard it. But in any case, if you have real responses, then uh, uh, the overall response rate here is getting improved with the combinations. Um, and that's um, actually one of the interesting principles. And I think the next one is even more interesting. Um, the, this compound is, uh, has been developed by Pharmacyclics, is now has been taken over by Johnson or Johnson Johnson. And data of the, for this compound at two different dose levels, 420 milligram and 840 milligram, were actually presented at the last ASH meeting. And now I flip through this with you like in a movie to show you these data because um, that will illustrate why they are so interesting. First of all, side effects. In red, grade four, you don't see any above. In uh, grade three, they are only very little. And you see that diarrhea is one of the major side effects of these inhibitors. Other than this, all the side effects are mild and also the diarrheas rarely reach grade three. There is, as um, you see here on this waterfall plot, almost every patient is responding. Uh, and the most interesting thing, and this is why I bring it here in this uh, refractory talk, uh, the high-risk features that are usually uh, seen in clinical trials are leading to good responses. So this here, you can take the overall response rate for all patients, and you can read it uh, that it's 60 to 70% in all categories. Which are the categories? Well, patients above 70, patients with very large lymph nodes, patients with deletion 17P, uh, deletion 11Q, which is not a, a dismal prognostic parameter anymore, but very high beta-2 microglobulin, and also per an analog refractory patients, our topic. So all of them do respond. And they respond for a long time. These remissions seem to last. I think it's a little premature because the studies have to go on and we have to look after a few months, but this looks extremely promising, and this looks even more promising because um, we, I've never seen before in this group of patients, the lesion 11, 17P, that the PFS would be up above 70% for a year. This would be new. If it's true, and we have to confirm this uh, by a longer follow-up in other trials, this would be a really true change in management. Okay, so now you have seen the options, and now we come to how to apply this. And um, I'm, as you know, always advocating that we no longer look at the age of our patients, but at the fitness. And uh, as you also know, the German study group has made some proposals. One is to take the creatinine clearance, not only because you have to reduce the dose of your drugs anyway, but because the kidney function and therefore the creatinine clearance is a good integrator of many physiological functions, in particular all the vessels, all the vascular system actually. Uh, if, it's, if you have um, atherosclerosis, usually the creatinine clearance goes down anyway. So we use a combination of creatinine clearance and a cumulative illness rating score um, as actually taken up by John Gribben um, in the blood journal and use these two things, the, the CIRS score plus the creatinine clearance to create three categories, go-go, slow-go, no-go. Here, maximal therapies, here, uh, intermediate intensity, here, no therapy, but supportive care. And um, because it's often asked, and you are, when you participate in our trials, you have applied this already, it's very simple, it's subjective, it is not reproducible in a single basis on a single patient, although if you rate differently, if you take different physicians and take this score, it's relatively reproducible. You, are, you, you can be quite surprised. And actually, 
the cumulative illness rating scale has been tested in geriatrics. It's not our invention. It is extremely reproducible. Uh, but it uses something that you have to use if you look at your patients in a relatively systematic way, and that's your intuition and your clinical judgment upon the patient. How sick is he or she? And that's only the only thing that you have to do. We chose it for reasons of simplicity. It takes you five minutes to, or even two to score your patient. If you have done this, you have a better feeling how the patient is doing. So basically, you list all the organ systems for mild or past problems, moderate problems, severe, uncontrollable, and extremely severe. And with simple, this simple score, we have conducted our trials. This is the uh, CRF that we are using. And it's only one proposal, but I'm so frequently asked now because this topic is uh, getting more and more important that I just wanted to show you how we do it. And actually, I don't have anything to, to do to defend this. I just have to say that it worked and it is simple. So we wanted to do it because it's so simple. Um, all right, so with this, we actually assess the fitness. So if we approach a patient that comes back and needs a second line treatment, the first thing I'm looking is how long has the response lasted? If the patient is refractory, so within six months or has not responded at all, or has progressed within two years, all these categories are actually summarized into one. Then I check the fitness first. If the patient is fit, then the key thing to do is to think about an allogeneic transplantation. It is not important how you achieve this remission. You can try several things, elimtuzumab, fludarabin plus elimtuzumab, FCR, doesn't really matter but we, we actually put him on a transplant protocol. Here there are many alternatives, some of them listed or studied at the last um, ASH meeting that you can also try. A situation becomes a lot more difficult and more challenging if the patient is not fit enough to undergo an allogeneic transplant. In this situation, you change the treatment. Basically, you do something else because the same treatment doesn't make any sense. And the options are basically what I've, talked, uh, what I've shown you in the entire talk, and I've listed it again here. Um, whatever you've done before, you switch to, for instance, elemtuzumab or BR, and so on and so forth. If the progression comes afterwards, then it's relatively easy. You can repeat the first-line treatment. Now, sometimes in my own practice, this is also a difficult thing because let's say a patient comes at 30 months, like... Um, one and two and a half years after FCR. And I start wondering, I mean, so the, these, these uh, cutoffs uh, or years actually are not so sharp as they, they seem, of course. And sometimes in a very young patient, this becomes a difficult choice. Nevertheless, we have done calculations, many of them, with FCR, and it seems really that around two years currently, with the modern chemoimmunotherapies, it's about right and it's based on data now. It was clinical intuition when I gave this talk, let's say, a year ago, but now we have calculated lots of data from the CLA protocol, and it seems really that all the patients that do relapse after two years do much better. So there's always a Gaussian distribution, of course, uh, and uh, sometimes we have to debate about this patient, but after, let's say, four years, five years, six years, you simply repeat FCR, and the patient will do fine again. All right, and with this, I think I'm uh, at the end of my talk, not without thanking all the uh, wonderful people working at the German CLS study group. Uh, there's another uh, fan and supporter of all the Canadian skiing activities, Clemens Wendner, who was also at this meeting here. Um, and I thank all these co-workers uh, co in Cologne and in Germany uh, because I'm only presenting the data. It's their work and not mine. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for a wonderful talk. I was interested in a number that you had. Uh, if I got it correct, you had 40 out of 143 patients that turned out to be high risk. Yes. So that's 29%. Yes. And that's, a, that's considerably more than the 17P, so there must be something additionally wrong with those people. Exactly. So, I was wondering whether your team had been beavering away on that and come up with, say, some gene array studies or some, some underlying uh, molecular biology rationale that, to be able to identify those patients. That's a 
wonderful question. It's, um, I honestly don't have any answer, but it's exactly the point that we are now to, trying to find out to um, characterize those patients, by the way, exactly with the techniques that you proposed, microarrays or, or others. There are eventually some 6Q deletions in this group, uh, but that's not the major explanation. And uh, as of now, we simply don't know. So we had to take, and maybe we will do so in the next few years, we had to take the MRD negativity as a surrogate marker in this group. We can't predict this uh, yet because the, this is missing. I'm relatively confident with all the novel genetic uh, defects that we are discovering in CLL, including NOTCH uh, and SF3B1 and so on and so forth, some of them might be explained by these molecular aberrations. But right now, uh, I have uh, no clue. But we are actively searching our, uh, our database, and then we will do the sequencing or molecular analysis in these patients. And, uh, Maybe in two or three years at the next cold conference, I'm going to show you the data. Um, Richard. Minimal residual disease. Yeah. Minimal, yeah repeat the question since it's, um, uh, it was um, barely audible on the right side in the front here. So MRD negativity, how is it defined? So um, basically there's a consensus paper um, uh, by the ERIC, but which was also uh, joined by uh, some American groups, including, for instance, uh, the group in San Diego, uh, that defines the um, threshold in one, of one in 10,000 leukocytes by four color flow. So it's a multi color flow cytometry, and I should have said that before, so that's a very good question. What we did in the CLL-8 protocol, then we applied this technique, but also compared it to PCR. And we also did a very systematic analysis of this in the blood and in the bone marrow, because the next apparent question could be, well, is it sufficient to do this in the blood, or can we, do we have to use the bone marrow? And the outcome of this, published in a smaller paper by uh, Sebastian Böttcher, is that you can use four-color flow from the blood. It's equally sensitive. There are a few discordant cases, but the, that's usually below 5%, so, and it's actually going both ways. Sometimes you overinterpret the data in the marrow and in the blood and vice versa, and therefore um, the blood seems to be totally sufficient for a clinical assessment of MRD for color flow cytometry, and I think it's going to be the key parameter to run clinical trials in the future because it will be a surrogate endpoint that you can read immediately after the treatment. Any other questions? Uh, actually, I have a question, a sort of practical question. Um, it was actually very uh, enticing to, to see that data on lit and lidomide. And uh, in clinical practice, how are you using it? You know, are, you, are you starting low dose and then increase? And for how long do you continue the drug for? Um, yeah, it's a good practical question. I'm usually starting, uh, if a, there's a residual tumor load, and most of our patients have a residual tumor load, I start as, at doses as low as 5 or 10 milligram. In the more fragile elderly patients, usually I start with 5 milligrams only, never with a full dose. And then I, I, I slowly increase at monthly uh, increments, if you want. So after one month, I consider whether the blood counts are okay, the platelets are still okay, um, and then I increase to the next dose level in five milligram steps. Um, and uh, basically, as soon as the platelets are dropping or I see other problems, then we reduce the dose. That's how we are doing it. Um, and I, I, yeah, it's a very, very good question and problem because you would be ill-advised and should not start with, let's say, 25 milligrams on a CLL patients because then you will have acute problems. <laughs> 